Hello everyone. Welcome to the DevRel webinar series of WSO2 Enterprise Integrator. Today, we will be looking at how you can process data efficiently with WSO2 Enterprise Integrator. This is Niro Tipen Mergelinka, and I'll be joined by Sajini Ranasinghe. Both of us work in integration team of WSO2. The agenda for the day will be, we will be having a brief introduction to Enterprise Indicator and Integration Studio IDE. And after that, we will be discussing the main topics for the day, which are data processing capabilities of the integrator, how you can transform data with the integrator, and how you can move data with the integrator. And after that, we'll be having two demos. First one is transforming data with the integrator, and the second one is streaming large files with the integrator. Then we'll have a questions time. Also, please note that you can ask questions throughout the webinar, and you can post your questions in the GoToWebinar panel. And once the webinar ends, we'll be sending out the recordings as well as slides to all the registrants. So WSO2 Enterprise is integrated. So although this is developer focus, just to bring everyone to the same page, I'll give, a, give some brief introduction to the integrator. So this is on top of battle tested integration runtime, and we are there in market from 2019. That is over 10 years we are in the market and we have a lot of customers all over the world using the indicator for commercial purpose and as well as there are open source users. And the indicator is capable of processing billions of transactions across thousands of deployments. And if you see the indicator, it can integrate legacy systems to the modern applications. That is easily you can integrate a legacy system to a modern application. So uh, what is a legacy system? So basically, say you have CSV fi files, or you have some SOAP protocols, or you have some application which is, ex which is exhibiting fixed transport, and you want to connect that to a modern application. So you can easily do that with the enterprise integrator and it provides you out of the support for all of this. And then comes the deployment. That is, you can deploy the integrator on premise as well as in containers. So enterprise integrator brings you the best of both worlds of centralized and container deployment and its adaptable nature makes it easier for the microservices world as well. So as you can see in this picture, you can integrate a lot of things using the integrator. So moving on to the integration studio IDE. So this is a GUI tool which, which you can drag and drop to build the integrations. So this comes with a cool set of features like you have pre-built integration templates. So as you can see in this picture, there are a lot of pre-built integration templates. You can just try them out and deploy them and get some experience with the integrator if you are a newbie. Then after that, we have support for 200 plus enterprise ready connectors. So if you see a real world application, we will have necessity to integrate something to a Salesforce or something to Azure or some Amazon buckets or etc. So for that, we have out of the box support with a lot of connectors and all of them are free of charge. You can just use them in your integration flow. And we have powerful data transformation capability and in, with the studio, we have debugging support, we have inbuilt unit testing framework and embedded HTTP fan. That is, while you are developing a integration, you don't need to leave the studio. You can test it there, you can debug it there, and you can write testing tests for there to be for it to be future proof. So 
moving on to the data processing cable. Now let's have a look at the main topic for the day, which is data processing capability software indicator. So if we take any real world application, we have we have to process some data. That is, we need to take some data, do something with it, and and we transfer it to a desired location. So basically, we have the requirement to extract the data and then transform it to the desired format and then transfer it. So as you can see in this picture, Enterprise Integrator is capable of extracting the data from different sources. That is, you can extract the data from databases, files, or SaaS applications, or from different transport protocols. That is, say if you have some data in a DMS queue, you can just fetch it and do some processing and send it to somewhere else. Yeah, you want. So now you have we have extracted the data from the source, but there is the destined app application on the other hand. But the data we have in our hand is in some other format, and we might the application might want it in some other format. So we will have to transform the data. So transform in the sense, we will have to manipulate the data. We will have, to, we may have to add some extra elements to the data. We might have to remove the, remove some elements of the data, or we might have to modify the data format, or we might have to add some constants here and there. So basically we will have a lot of requirements like that application will be expecting a JSON, but the source application will be giving out as a so so format or as the or as we will have a csv data in this hand and there we might need some json or or it differs from use case to use case but all these use cases wso to ea provide out of the box capabilities for you to transfer them that is there are a lot of data processing constructs available and you can do some transformations with them very easily. So we will be looking at them in detail in upcoming slides. Then now we have taken the data and we have transformed the data. And now our requirement is to send the data to the desired location. So to send the data, we can send it over HTTP or some GMS protocol. So we can write it in files or we might need to transfer it over FTP FTPs and etc. So for all those things, Enterprise Integrator provides you different different options. So you can use those options and do data processing easily with the Enterprise Integrator. Now we will be discussing about how you can transform data with the Integrator, and Sajini will be continuing from this point. Over to you, Sajini. Um. Thank you, Nirotipan. So I'll share my screen first. Um, hope you can uh, see my screen. Uh, so I'll be walking you through the next set of slides from here on but, uh, So the first, uh, let's see what are the data transformation capabilities we have in the WSO2 integrator. Uh, before just going into the details on that topic, let me introduce you to the most fundamental uh, yet very important unit in WSO2 ESB profile, which is the mediator. Actually, what is a mediator? A mediator is the basic message, message processing unit in the ESB profile. And at the runtime, it has access to all the parts of the ESB profile along with the current message. Uh, as you can see in this diagram, a mediator can take a message and carry out uh, some predefined actions on it and do, uh, can do virtually anything with the message and then output the modified message. And also the ESP profile uh, ships with a range of mediators that are capable of carrying out a various tasks on input messages. And so in the upcoming slides, I'll be briefly explaining uh, you some of the key mediators available in the integrator for the data processing requirements. So let's first uh, move on to the first mediator, which is the data mapper mediator. Uh, let's say uh, you have the data and you want to convert or transform the format of the data to another. For instance, you have a CSV payload and you need to convert it to a JSON or a XML payload. 
uh, or else you have an XML data and you want to convert it to a JSON payload. Uh, also, by converting, you need to change the structure of the data as well. In other words, you need to map the data to another format. Uh, for this purpose, you can use the data mapper mediator available in the integrator. Uh, as you can see in this diagram, uh, this is the graphical user interface which is available inside the integration studio. Uh, here you can see we have given uh, uh, an XML payload as, as an input here and we need to uh, convert it to a, a JSON payload like this. Uh, to do that, you can draw a data mapping diagram like this and get your transformation done. And also in integrator, uh, we have this AI based graphic, uh, graphical mapping editor, which you can easily use to do the data mapping. Uh, okay, now let's see uh, the other mediators we have. Uh, the, the, the payload mediator. Uh, let's say based on the information in the received data, you need to create a text or an XML or rather a JSON payload. Or else, uh, let's say you need to manipulate some of the fields of the received payload as in this diagram. Uh, so if you can see here, uh, we have JSON format like that and we have converted to a, another format, JSON format like that. Uh, so also uh, for, for this purpose, uh, you can actually use the payload me factory mediator that we have in our WSO2 integrator. Um, also, this mediator supports XPath and JSON expressions to obtain values for target payload. Um, uh, then let's see uh, the other mediator, which is the Enrich mediator. Uh, let me explain the Enrich mediator's capabilities using an example. Uh, suppose uh, you have an XML payload or a JSON payload like this in the first box and you need to convert it to another JSON payload, like you need to add a child or a sibling uh, to it. As you can see here, I have added a, a child to the sample array uh, in the first book, the, the, the JSON in the first box. And let's say uh, other than that, you need to uh, replace the current message with the part of the message like this in the second box. Uh, these kind of transformations and many more other capabilities uh, are, can be achieved uh, through the English mediator in integrator. Um, uh, now let's move on to the next mediator, which is a script mediator. Actually, the script mediator is a powerful solution that we have in our enterprise integrator. Uh, let's say you have a complex processing to be done to your payload, but you cannot find a simple alternative solution to that using other ESB mediators. In that case, uh, you can use the script mediator to perform your data transformations. For example, let's say you uh, you have you need to do a string replacement in the payload, and uh, you need to do it after checking uh, complex conditions. And for the, uh, for those kind of scenarios, uh, the script mediator would be a trivial as it would be in a JSON script object. JavaScript object, sorry. Uh, with that being said, let me tell you the script mediator supports the scripting languages such as JavaScript, Groovy, and Ruby. Um, then let's see, uh, let's see about the class mediator we have in the integrator. Occasionally, there can be very complex data processing that are hard to build using the standard mediators we have in the integrator. In that case, you can write your own class mediator. So this is going to be a Java program. Hence, you have a complete control over the payload and you, you can do whatever the transformation you need to the payload. And then let's see uh, what are the other transformation we can do. Another way of transformation uh, transforming the data is by using a predefined schemas such as uh, such as JSON schemas, XSLT configurations, or smooth configurations, and etc. A WSO2 inter uh, enterprise integrator is capable of doing uh, such transformations using schema and configuration files. For example, we have this newly introduced uh, JSON transform mediator which is capable of transforming an XML or a JSON payload, payload uh, to another JSON payload with the help of a JSON schemas. 
Uh, similarly, you can use the accessibility mediator to perform a transformation to the payload uh, based on the accessibility configuration. Uh, moreover, uh, we can uh, we also support a data transformation based on the smokes configurations using our smokes mediator. So as you can uh, see in this diagram, here you need to give a payload along with the schema or a configuration, and with the relevant uh, mediator, you can get the modified payload as you desire. So this is the this is a brief explanation about the WSO2 integrators data transformation capabilities. And now let's talk about what are, the, uh, what are the capabilities we have in the enterprise integrator for moving the data from one data source to another. Uh, when talking about moving data, we can consider a lot of scenarios such as moving data uh, from a file to another file or uh, from a database to another database or database to another JMSQ, likewise. However, in this webinar, I'll be explaining you how you can transfer the file uh, uh, file data to another location so let's see how we can transfer how we can transfer the file using integrator actually uh, you can achieve this uh, requirement uh, using two approaches uh, either you can use the vfs transport rather the virtual file system transport or you can use the file connector for that Actually, the file connector supports a range of file operations uh, to do to play with the files, such as uh, you can read, you, you can need the read operation to read, and there is this uh, write operation and the split operations likewise. And um, if I talk about uh, the VFS transport a little bit, we have actually the support for FTP and SFTP, and also for the SMB 2.0 version protocols of the uh, transport. Uh, in the upcoming releases, we will be releasing uh, the SMB 3.0 support also for the VFS transport. So there, uh, so here, uh, there is an important uh, thing to uh, say. Let's say if you need to transfer large files, you need to do, uh, and you need to, if you want to transfer a large file, you need to do it in the streaming mode. And let's say if you're going to use the VFS transport for, for that, then you need to enable the streaming there in the VFS transport. Or, uh, or else, if you are going to use the file connector, then you have to enable the streaming mode there in the file connector. Uh, so this is a brief introduction uh, on how we can transfer a file using the integrator. Uh, so uh, before like move move into further, let's have a quick recap on what we have covered so far. Uh, first, we talked about what a mediator is and what what is what it is capable of doing, and then uh, we talk about the key mediators that we can use for our data processing and what are the capabilities of them. So if you need to get more familiar about these mediators and the other in, in WSO2 integrated concepts, you can easily refer to our official documentation or else you can refer to our past webinar series for more information. So from here onwards, we'll be demonstrating two demos and the first demo will be covered by Nirothipan. So over to you, Nirothipan, to the first demo. Thank you, Sajini. Let me share my screen. Okay, guys, I hope you can see my screen. So, moving to the first demo. So, in this demo one, we'll be having a use case where we are reading some account details from a CSV file and updating it to the Salesforce. So, imagine a scenario where we have a CSV file with about large records and we need to up update all those details to the Salesforce. That is in the CSV file, imagine that we have some account details. So for example, just have a look at this CSV file over here. And I have some account details with company name, phone numbers, and etc. And I want to send it to the Salesforce. So I'm going to explain how, how we can do that with the integrator. So as a first thing, this file is very large. So we can't just take everything in the one go and load the Salesforce or load the HTTP steps so that everything get exhausted and we will run into issues. 
So what we have to do is we will have to split them into separate chunks. That is, we will have to split this big file into smaller files and then process them one by one. So after we are splitting it, we will be processing one at a time and then sending it to the Salesforce. So, okay, so imagine we have split it. So we have taken the file, split it. Now we have the VFS transport, which can pull each file. Then, but after taking the file, what we have is a CSV. But then again, in the, in the other hand, Salesforce needs some JSON payload. So we will be using some data mapper mediator to transform the CSV to JSON. And then we'll be set using the Salesforce REST connector to send it to the Salesforce. So the so I'll not I'll not be developing these artifacts from the scratch. And the artifacts are already developed. And this is available here in this GitHub link. So if you check out this GitHub repo, you can see the artifacts here. Then I'll, I'll now explain how you can import these artifacts to the integration studio and use it. So let me switch to the integration studio. So this is the integration studio front page. So you can, as I explained earlier, you have a good set of templates here. You can try it out and you have the lot of features here. So I'm not going to create a new integration project. I'm going to open an existing project. So you just need to press an open project. And I'm going to, already I have the project checkout in my local, so I'm going to select it. So I'm browsing it. And inside that, I'm going to select the project. So if you check out, you will be able to see this project, all these four projects. So just export it from the root directory here and press OK. And now, once I finish it, the project will be exported here. So if I see here, the project is exported and this is a basic base integration project. And inside it, it has four different child projects. And all four of them have different meanings. Like this is the main configuration project and this is the connector exporter project. That is when we use some connector, we just put it here and deploy it to the server. And this is a project to hold the registry artifacts. And this is a composite application project, which, which packs all these and deploy it to the server. So since I have the project pre-built, I'm just importing it and opening it. And let me go through the artifacts and explain them briefly. So, So if we have a look at the artifacts here, I have an API and I have some proxies, I have some sequence and endpoint. So as it first said here in the use case here, so first I need to read the file and need to split the files. So the first thing is I'm going to do the splitting part. So the splitting part, I'm going to leverage the file connector which is present in the integration studio for the splitting purpose. So once this, once the request comes to this API, it will set some properties to honor the MVP patterns, and then we will be splitting the file using the file connector. So as you can see in the right panel, I, since the file connector is already imported to the project, the file connector operations will be visible here, and you can see a lot of operations here. So from all of these, I just need a split operation. So you can just drag and drop, but we are not doing it from the scratch. So you can refer to other webinars, how to get familiar with the integrations too. So here we are having some property group mediator, which expects some properties and we are splitting the file using the split file split operations of the file split file connector. So for this file split operations, we are expecting two arguments. That is the location of the source CSV file and to which folder it should split and one more operation, one more parameter, which is the number of lines to split. So basically, as I explained, this is a large file and I'm not going to process it in one go and load it to the sales source. So I'm going to split it by chunks using the number of lines and then process it one by one. So I'm just splitting it with line numbers of nine. So you can try it with different numbers as per your use case. 
and I'll be in the request, I'll be sending the source location and the destination folder. So anyway, I'll be sending a JSON request, something like this. But here, as you can see, I am giving some payload as CSV and target folder. But here in the properties, I'm just taking it as OCSV and destination folder. So these properties are extracted from the JSON payload using the JSON eval expression. So I have done that using properties inside this property group mediator. So basically it has three properties and using the JSON eval, I have extracted them. So you can refer the documentation for more details or to get familiar with these expressions and etc. So once I send this request, so this API is supposed to split this file using this file split operation and add the splitted files to this target folder. Okay, so now we have imagined I have sent the request and the files are split. But now the question is who is going to take that file and send it to over to the Salesforce? So for that, I have developed a proxy service. That is this one, CSV to Salesforce proxy. So basically, this is a proxy with BFS transport enabled. So if you can see here, this is BFS enabled transport. So that means it keeps on listening to a folder, and when there are some files in that folder, it will take that file and do some processing defined here. So basically, this BFS has some service level parameters. So these are the service level parameters, like to which directory it should listen, what it should do for the files after processing, et cetera, et cetera. So I won't be explaining all the parameters, but we'll be covering them in the second demo. So I'll specify some parameters specific only to this demo. Here I have a parameter called file process count. So what this means is, Basically, I'm going to process only one file at a time. That is, I'm not going to load it. I'm just going to process one by one. So the transfer transferring happens smoothly. And I have specified some operations. So if you go through this, you will be able to identify all these parameters are self-explanatory. Self okay. So this VFS proxy is listening to the folder. So basically, this is supposed to listen to the folder where this API is splitting the files. So once the files comes there, it will take the files one by one and send it to the sales source. Okay. So imagine the files are there now. Now we need to see how we are going to send it to the sales source. But before that, before sending to the sales source, we need to transfer the payload to the sales source format. So we need some payload transformation so that is done in this sequence so if i go to this sequence here i have a data mapper mediator which is capable of doing the salesforce transformation csv to json so i just go to it and do a brief explanation so here i can import some input csv file and i can specify the output format i want and it will transfer it so as i showed you earlier this is the input csv and to the sales force i need it in the in this json format that is all all this every single record should be inside this json object there so i need to transform that csv to the json so i just need to import the input csv here and do the import the output JSON format here and do some transformation. And since I need a constant called account here, I have defined a constant from this constants functions and mapped it here. So I'll do a example transformation here so that you can visualize. So I'm just putting three CSV data and I'm just trying it out. So from here, you can see how the transformation happens inside the data mapper mediator. So end of the day, after data method, this will give a JSON output like this. Okay, so now we have the CSV transform it to JSON. But after that, we need to send it to the 
Salesforce. Now let's get back to our proxy here. We have we added a lock first a lock message when the message reaches the proxy. Then we added a transformation. Then we are having a Salesforce update sequence which will update to the Salesforce. And then finally we are printing some lock just for the audit purpose. So let us go to inside this sequence. So in this sequence, in the very beginning, there are some properties added, which is which are by property group mediator. And then I'm just initializing my Salesforce connection. So if you are familiar with the Salesforce, you will know that we need to provide some details to do some rest course to the Salesforce. That is, we will have to provide some access token, refresh token, host names, and etc. etc. So you can refer our docs on how to get all these tokens and configure the sales force. But now for the time being, I'll just explain only one parameter here. So this access token. So what I have done here is I have, so I can just, I could have just hard coded the access token here, giving it as a value. But what I have done here is I have retrieved it from an environment variable. So from the environment variable, I am retrieving the Salesforce access token. So basically I have exported it to the environment. I'm retrieving it from the environment so that if something changes, I can change it so that I don't need to come here and modify my integration. And also it's a safer approach. Likewise, you can provide all other parameters here. And then I'm using a Salesforce create multiple records operation so as I, if you remember I, I said about file connector likewise for the salesforce rest connector it has its own set of operations different different operations like create create multiple records and etc so in this use case we will be using create multiple records and this create multiple records we need to pass two parameters those are S object name and the field value. So these parameters, I am just taking it from the message context, that is from the JSON payload, which is coming out of the data mapper mediator. I am just retrieving using the properties here, using the JSON evas and passing it to this one. Okay, so that's it about the integration I developed. Now let's move to the deployment part. So as I said earlier, you can deploy your integrations inside the embedded micro indicator. So basically inside this developer integration studio, we have an integration server embedded. And you can deploy the integrations there itself and test, test it. So to deploy it, you just need to right click on this composite, composite application. And you can run on micro indicator. But as I said earlier, I have configured the environment variables here itself. So if you go to the run, run configurations, you can set up the environment variables. So I'm going to deploy it in, in the micro integrator embedded server, run a micro integrator. Then it will prompt and ask for the set of projects I, I need to select to deploy. So basically there are three set of projects. The config project with all the artifacts, APIs and et cetera. And the registry resource project. So basically this has the Artifacts which are needed for the data mapper mediator that is input and output transformations and etc And then we have the connector exporter project That is since we are using two connectors here in this project file connector and the salesforce stress connector It has the connector exporters. So I have selected all of them and I'll just finish So when I do the finish the micro integrator will start And we will be able to see the locks here so here I'll just expand this. So the embedded micro indicator is starting and the and this project is deployed by the integration studio here. So this, this started and it is deploying. And once it started, you will help get a help template here as well. So basically what you can see in the help runtime service view is you can see all the API is deployed, proxy is deployed. That is basically you can see all the services which are deployed in the micro indicator runtime. And if you even 
need more details, we have the embedded monitoring dashboard also here. So you can click on this option and the dashboard will open up in the browser and you can browse through them. So I have deployed this. Now I need to send a request to the API I specified, to this API to split the file. So before I split the file, let me show you my file system. So, so the source file is going to be here. I'm going to take this source file. This is the file I showed you there, this data set. And I'm going to split it to this target folder, Salesforce. So as I said, I'm going to send the request with the parameters. So here, this is my request. So this is the request URL. So you can just copy paste the URL from here. So this is the API URL and I'm sending a post request with this is the CSV file location and this is the target folder. So as soon as my I send this request, the expectation is the files should be split into multiple files and it should come to this target folder, which is called Salesforce. So let me send that request. Okay, I have sent this request and there are a lot of files which has come. And as I explained, the BFS proxy has already started processing files one by one. And once it processes, it will move those files to the processed file location. So if we see the locks here, as I explained earlier, there are two locks. So we have added two locks here. So one is, so let me go to the proxy view. So here in the proxy, we added one lock and another one lock when, when it's upload the records from each file to print from each file and the final log to indicate that the, all the updates are, all the records are updated to the sales source. So it has started processing files and just one more and it has finished processing all the files. So after processing, it has moved to this process folder. So now if we go to the sales source and check, we will be able to see our records we updated. Here you can see the records I have updated. So these are from here. So this is about Salesforce, CSV to Salesforce integration. And now we will be having another demo and Sajini will be doing that. Over to you, Sajini. Uh, thank you, Nirvatipun. Uh, let me share my screen again. I hope everyone can see my screen. So, uh, I'll be doing, uh, so I'll be expl explaining you the second demo that we have prepared for this webinar. Uh, so in this demo, I'll show you how you can move large files using integrator. So to demonstrate that, I'm going to use nearly a 1.5 GB size text files located at my local machine, and I'm going to transfer it to the uh, FT, uh, local FTP server using, a, using the VFS transport. So if I just show you my uh, file system, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, I'm going to have uh, so uh, I'm going to have a file, a large file in the source directory, and I'm going to transfer it to the uh, FTP location that I have uh, can, uh, that I have started in my local machine uh, to this uh, destination folder. So let's see um, how we can do that. Uh, so here. Uh, we will be uh, building a VFS proxy to pull the data as a stream uh, from a source location and a VFS endpoint to transfer that data as a stream through a desired FTP location. Uh, so let's move to the demo. Uh, as mentioned before, actually we have already built all the uh, related artifacts uh, to this use case. So I'll just uh, first show you the VFS proxy uh, service we have configured. Uh, for this use case. Um, so when it comes to configuring a VFS proxy service, uh, there is a list of service level parameters actually you need to add to the proxy service. Uh, let me just show you uh, the, the service level parameters we have configured and I'll explain you the important ones one by one. So if I just click on the proxy service here, uh, there will be a property pane appearing at the bottom of the uh, integration studio. And if I just quickly uh, scroll down a little bit. 
you can see the proxy parameters that we have configured in this service uh, proxy service. Uh, let me get uh, one first. Uh, uh, so let's uh, see the first URL. Uh, so here we have used a file URI parameter. So this is to actually define the URI of the file location, the source file location, right? So I have configured my one here. And then uh, we have configured the second parameter, uh, which is the content type parameter. And uh, which uh, and here this is to define the content type of the files uh, processed by the transport. So here I'm going to uh, you, I'm gonna uh, process. I'm gonna pull uh, the files with the uh, content type of application of text stream, and then uh, let's see the third parameter, which is uh, the file name uh, pattern parameter. And so by providing a regex here, uh, you uh, we can let the transport receiver to know uh, to uh, to what type of files it needs to be. It needs to fetch from the source file location. So here I here I have put the text uh, widget, so it will be only fetching or pulling the text files from my source location. And then the other parameter, uh, which is the poll interval parameter. Uh, so this is going to be the poll. So I have configured the 15 as a number as the value, and this is going to be the polling interval for the transport receiver to pull the file uh, URI location. Uh, so the value normally if I only put an integer here, it could be taken as a seconds. And if you need to configure it as a milliseconds, you need to add millisecond as uh, like this here. Okay, uh, I just leave it as seconds here. Um, so before going to the other parameters, so if you say you can see there are another set of parameters here. So before going to the other parameters, let me just uh, tell you an important point. Uh, well. With a VFS transport, uh, the first uh, the 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 files cannot remain in the source directory after processing, unless you specifically want to process them again. Uh, therefore, to remove the process files uh, from the source uh, location, the WSO2 integrator provides you two options as move and delete. Uh, so, I have configured uh, this action after process parameter. And have given the move uh, action here because uh, in this scenario uh, I need to keep track of which file have been created, which files have been uh, processed, and I have I have to uh, keep uh, I have to move them to another location. To move them the process file to another file location, I have configured this uh, move after process parameter like this. I have given another uh, source, uh, another file location to here as the value. And similarly. Uh, you can do the same uh, to address the failure scenario. Let's say you need to um, move the parameter, move the uh, files processed, uh, files support by your proxy service, and uh, in a failure scenario. Let me just show you the relevant parameter from here um, action after failure. So from this parameter, I have for this parameter, I have configured again the action as move, and in the failure scenario, the uh, the files will be transferred to the given uh, location. And then um, now we come to the most important uh, parameter in this scenario, which is the streaming parameter. As I mentioned before in the previous slides, if you need to transfer large files over VFS or or, or a file connector, uh, you need to actually transfer, you need to actually enable the streaming mode like this. So I have enabled the streaming mode by putting the value as true. It is a very important thing. Um, so yeah, now I have uh, mentioned all the VFS service level parameters that we need to configure in this service proxy, uh, proxy service, sorry. Um, with the uh, with these configurations, actually, you can simply pull a file from a source location. And now let's see how we can transfer the files that we just pull from a source location to another target location. Uh, for that, I have actually configured a mediation pro as this. Uh, let's I'll just go through one by one. Uh, uh, 
so at the beginning i have added log mediator like this uh, for the weaving purpose so i'll be uh, log so the server will be logging a message whenever the proxy service pulls a file from a source location and then i have added a set of properties that will be required to the to this use case using the property group mediator uh, and then um, uh, and also uh, from the from the properties that we have in here uh, for example for example from these out only properties we can actually uh, we have an added the mep pattern to the mediation flow and then at the end i have added uh, a call mediator to call the vfs endpoint uh, let me just uh, um, so the vfs endpoint i have uh, defined it as a vfs and with the, with the name vfs endpoint so let me just quickly show you the VFS endpoint that we have uh, created for this scenario. So here I have created an address endpoint and also for the URI I have given my FTP location uh, as the target location at the target location where I need to transfer my files. Uh, so actually uh, so these two parameters are going to be the only configurations that we need to that we need to uh, transfer large files from one location to another so now uh, let's try to run this scenario and see whether uh, we can do what we actually intended to do right uh, so to run the scenario so i'm gonna use the embedded micro integrator runtime available in the integration studio uh, so let me just click on the uh, let me just click on our project here and i'm going to click on the play button here and here, from here, I can select what are the artifacts I'm going to uh, deploy to the server. So for this scenario, I'll I'll, I'll have to only uh, um, add these two uh, these two configurations artifacts, which is the VFS proxy service we created and the VFS endpoint. Uh, so let me just finish and uh, let the server start. Yeah, so as you can see here, the server has successfully started. Um, and then with this uh, side pane, you can see our proxy service has been successfully created. So this is a, a new feature that we have uh, added to the integration studio. Uh, and uh, let's see uh, how this scenario works. Let me just uh, add, so here I have this uh, 1. Point, uh, or nearly 1.5 GB file, text files, and I'm going to add it to the source uh, folder. So whenever I add it to the source folder, it should be transferred to the desired location to here. Let me just add it to the source file, source location. And whenever I add this, if the proxy service pulls it uh, correctly, I might I have to have a look uh, printing here. Yeah. So we I have the I have the look saying the transferring file name sample text file to the FTP location. Uh, so uh, since it's a, a, a bit large file, it will take around uh, some millisecond, uh, one, uh, a couple of seconds. And if whenever it's moved correctly, I can see it in the processed file. Uh, process folder like this and also if i go to the destination folder you i can see the output that uh, the transferred file has been uh, transferred to here okay so actually uh, so this is the this is how we can actually uh, stream large files using integrator so that's all what we have for the webinar today so and thank you for joining us and we'll we would be happy to answer the questions from here onwards if we have any okay we have a question so can we test connect this unit using unit testing framework uh yes you can test the connectors so basically if you want to test the connectors you have to add it to some sequence or something and build a unit test on top of that and test the connectors so we have done previous training sessions on that and you can refer them okay there seems another question 
that is whether we can monitor the logs using the monitoring dashboard so basically you can't monitor the logs but you can down download the logging log files using the monitoring dashboard and also you can do the logging changing configurations so this will be available in the upcoming release okay there is another question can we make use of streaming feature to process large files instead of just moving it okay in that case uh, i assume that what you are asking is uh, load the large file to the memory and do some transformation on top of it and process, move, move it basically if you are to do that you you will have to have a lot of memory and we don't really recommend it for that purpose you can use streaming integrator and you can refer more to the our previous webinar the part one of this which we have demonstrated those things with the streaming integrator okay the next question is how about parallel processing multiple files so i assume that you are asking you want to you want to process for multiple files at a thing at a time so basically i have so in the demo I, I told i have just processed one file at a time just not to load but if you want to process multiple files parallelly you can still do that so if you don't specify that with the vfs transport that is number of files to process it will take multiple files and process it but it depends on the memory you have allocated and the available threads and etc so you can still do that okay that's a question about apm for transforming in apm how we do is so i assume you are asking about ap manager uh, wsr ap manager so basically the main purpose of api manager is to manage the apis that is the throttlings the tires and etc so if you want to do some very big integrations we recommend using enterprise integrator there embedded that is as a backend service and use it with the api manager but if you want to do some minor transformation of minor integrations you can just do it in the ap manager the same way you do it in the er okay there's another question even after completing the records processing still wso2 is holding memory is there any short solution for that so i guess you are referring to the wso2 ei and you are saying that it's holding the memory even after everything is completed basically that shouldn't happen and if it's happening it should be a bug please report a github issue with all the details we will look into that okay there is another question can we add custom token generated to all jura in the api using wso2 apm or ea uh, i'm really pretty really not sure in which context you are asking this question so i guess you want to append some tokens to the uri in the api uh, you can do it but uh, could you please explain more about this question so that we can ask it to go with connectors for some saas based applications like qb or netsuit or call the saas provided rest of sort aps using colos and mediators so basically if you see what a connector is connector is the predefined set of templates so basically inside the connector as, as i have used the salesforce rest connector what it finally does is it calls the rest or sa rest endpoints of the salesforce using colos and mediators but it has predefined set of operations which are preformatted so if a connector is available out of the box you can simply use that so it is developed and it's nicely templated but still if if you can 
achieve the use case using call mediator or send mediator and if your use case is not to reuse it you can simply do it with those mediators and get it done so it really depends on the your use case can this be seen in ea analytics i'm not sure which you are referring as to be seen so basically ea analytics is for the pur purpose of analyzing the statistics of the ei so that is with the ea analytics you can have a look at how many requests have arrived to the ea server over the time period and there are a lot more things you can explore with the ea analytics but if you have enabled tracing you can even have a look at the payload and you can have a look at the times which have taken for each mediator transform transforming the processing and etc uh, another question micro gateway integrator and ea do the same thing so micro gateway integrator there is not there is nothing called micro gateway integrator so i guess you are referring to the micro integrator and ei so micro integrator is a minimized version of ei but which support it is a light version of ei but it supports support centralized deployments as well as container deployments so basically both of them does the same but there's another product called micro gateway which is a minimum which is the lightweight version of api manager so those are two different things how do we configure environment variables how can we configure different values for environment variables for different environments so basically this is not really a wso2 specific question so uh, if you see the mediation we are just retrieving the properties from the environment so that is how you retrieve the property so if you want to export them to the environment so for example in linux you can just do it in the terminal that is you can just do it with an export command and it it varies from operating systems to systems so that way you can configure the environment variables okay there is a one more follow up question because some connectors do not have full support example netsort doesn't provide me all operations that they offer and also the source of authentication is used in a more password based okay so that means because of that you want to use some call or send me yes uh, that that's a current limitation that should be a current limitation with a netsort connector and you can if you can achieve your use case with call or send mediators you can do it or else you can still improve the connector and contribute to us still in open source you can improve the connector and contribute to us i think few more questions but we will be answering there with them via the email since the time is up we will wrap up so thank you everyone for listening to the webinar and we'll be sending out a small questionnaire with three to four questions to get your feedback so please spare some minutes to fill them out thank you very much